Hey gang, we are in Sioux Falls, South Dakota today, and we are at the St. Michael Catholic Cemetery here. And we're gonna visit the grave of a man named Thomas Egan. He was hanged three times. And it's actually a pretty terrible tale, how they did it and why. And then there's a huge twist at the end. So we'll talk about that. Let's walk to his grave. He's way, way, way down there, all by himself, at the very end. So Thomas came from Ireland, potato famine. A lot of Irish were coming here and going all sorts of places, escaping the famine. And it was 1866, he married a woman named Mary Hayden Lyons. Mary was from Madison, Wisconsin. She was a widow. And she had a five-year-old daughter whose name was Catherine. Now, they would eventually have three more children together, all boys. And life was good. About 10 years later, the family moved to Dakota Territory. They staked a farm and built a sod home. But their daughter, Catherine, would choose to stay behind in Madison with relatives until the rest of them would get set up and settled in the new territory. And that was kind of typical, where some family would stay behind, mostly with immigrants. But she did join them. It was 1879, and in November of that same year, she would marry a man named James Van Horn, who was a neighbor. So everything was going fine with the family, settling in. But then, all of a sudden, one day, Mother Mary went missing. They couldn't find her. Three days went by, and finally she was found dead. She was in the basement, in the basement of the home. Now, suspicion immediately fell on husband Thomas, Thomas Egan, and eventually he was charged with her murder. And then there were some horrifying facts, supposed facts that were coming out in court. It was said that on the morning of September 12th, 1880, Thomas sent, her, sent their children away, Sylvester, John, and Tommy, so he could carry out his grim task. They said he approached her as she washed dishes, threw a rope around her neck, and he began to strangle her. While she was incapacitated, he brutally beat her about the head with a club until he was sure she was done for. And after that, he threw her in the basement through a trap door, a trap door that was in the floor. She was actually found having moved toward a wall. She was still alive in the end. And she had put herself in a semi-reclining position. And this suggested that she had expired pretty much a, a fair amount of time after this attack. Now, neighbors were horrified, and they testified that the couple argued often. So the trial began, and then came the real shocking testimony. It came from James and Catherine, the stepdaughter and her husband, the Van Horns. They testified for the prosecution. It was December 1881 when the trial ended, and Thomas was found guilty of murder. Now, the defense asked for a new trial. It's May of 1882, but that was denied. And the Honorable Judge Jefferson Kidder sentenced him to death by hanging. And upon this sentence, Thomas Egan protested. The first thing he said was, Amen. I guess I can stand it. And then he looked and pointed at Catherine and James right there in the courtroom, and he said, They betrayed me. May the curse of God be upon them. 
and he pointed to his stepdaughter and he said, I can stand it, sir. The law may not reach the Van Horns, but the curse of God will. Well, a noose was ordered from a company in Lincoln, Nebraska that specialized in this. It was woven of silk and hemp, and it came actually with a written guarantee. The rope arrived late on the night before the scheduled hanging. Of course, it was not tested. Thomas Egan was given a hearty last breakfast on the morning of his execution. This was July 13th of 1882. He was read the death warrant at 9.10 a.m. His arms were tied and he was walked to the gallows. At 9.34 a.m. he was placed in position right over the trap door with the noose on his neck. And at 9.35, Sheriff Dixon sprung the trap. Now Thomas dropped five and a half feet, at which point the rope snapped with a report like a percussion cap, quote unquote. It was testified. He landed on his feet and fell on his face and stomach, all the while emitting what was described by a witness as a most blood-curdling noise. What did they do? Well, four men brought him back up to the gallows. A new rope was found, a manila rope. It was put back around his neck. And they sprung the trap door again, this poor guy. And before the rope could be adjusted correctly, Thomas was unable to drop far enough to snap his neck. So now he's there strangling to death. So what do they do? They haul him up again, and this time they finally did it correctly. More than 10 minutes after he was first dropped, he was finally pronounced dead. It was 9.46 a.m. What a terrible, terrible case. Now for the twist, twist, twist. So, it's about 45 years later. Catherine was on her deathbed. And she decides she's going to make a confession. A lifelong confession to get off her conscience. She said that she is the one who killed her mother. They had an argument. And she killed her mother and threw her in the basement. I think she beat her. She wasn't dead, you know, just like we were saying. She died later down there, but Catherine conspired with her husband to get everything blamed on poor Thomas. Yeah. She wrote a letter. She then died, and everyone, of course, was, you know, no one saw that coming the stepdaughter. The governor here gave Thomas a pardon, and I think it was more recently, if not an apology. I know it was an apology, maybe a pardon, but yeah, it's a, it, it was the big story. And if you go downtown to the courthouse, there's a big marker there that talks about the innocent man. The innocent man that was hanged, Thomas Egan. Now we're way back in the farthest corner of the cemetery. And you have to wonder, you have to say, you have to say that it's probably because he was, think about it, when they buried him, it's like, oh, this guy's a murderer. Let's put him in the pauper section, or let's let's put him in the put him in the corner. There are more graves here that have come in. I checked the dates; they're all much later graves. And right up there is the baby section. In this section, sixteen. But yeah, he's here all by himself. Poor guy.
I'm sure this is a new stone. He may have, he may have even been unmarked. So that's the story of poor Thomas Egan. Not only was he convicted wrongly and executed, but can you imagine the 10 minutes of horror and suffering that he had to endure? Rest in peace, Thomas Egan.